Congressman Paul, come on up. Hey, Nate. Good job. <laughs> Congressman Ron Paul, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. You have three minutes for an opening statement. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation and thank you for the format. I understand that we were supposed to address the subject of first principles. I've been trying to do that for about 35 or 40 years, and I welcome the opportunity to talk about first principles. Because that's what America is all about, and the first principle for America should be liberty. And I think we've forgotten about that, and we now are run by a bunch of lobbyists and special interests, and we have forgotten about liberty. But uh, Thomas Jefferson was very clear about liberty, and he told us where liberty came from. It came from the, our creator. It didn't come from our government. And uh, if we believe in liberty, we have to also understand exactly what our revolution was all about. Because the contest then at that time was uh, against tyranny, as all history has been, tyranny versus liberty. We had the best taste of liberty ever. And we had the freest country and the most prosperous country. And today, it is slipping away. The last 100 years, I think it's been slipping away, and it's a real challenge. But the founders decided that liberty was the cause, and it should be the cause of all political action. And for that reason, they wrote a document that was not perfect, but it was really the best ever written. And it was designed for the purpose of indicating how to limit government. So the Constitution was written for the sole purpose of limiting the federal government, and that's what it should do. And the business was supposed to be left to the people and to the republic. I do not like the word democracy. The founders didn't like the word democracy, and we're supposed to defend our, our republic, which means personal liberty and limited government. But what did they put into the Constitution? They put some very precise things into the Constitution, and a lot of it has been distorted. The general revenue clause is grossly distorted. We have to re revisit that to make sure that people don't use that to endorse the welfare state. We have to look at the interstate commerce clause and not use that as an excuse to raise regulate everything in and out of state and interstate. We ought to look at the uh, necessary and proper clause in Article 1, Section 8, because that's been grossly abused. We ought to look at things like Article 1, Section 8 that tells us what we can do and can't do. And maybe we'd quit going to wars without declaration wars if we really understood these issues. But more importantly than maybe all of them, because it is the litmus test on restraining government, and that is our founders detested the idea and understood the danger of allowing governments and central banks to print money out of thin air, because that it is guaranteed that government will spend too much money if the politicians know that there's somebody always there to print the money. That is the reason it's in there. No gold, only gold and silver can be legal, uh, legal tender. If we believe in liberty and believe in the Constitution, believe me, we would understand exactly what has made America great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ron, let's, let's keep that uh, train of thought going. And again, thanks for, for coming. Uh, the federal government now has a lot of control over education, health care, transportation, energy, banking, you know, financial inst institutions. If you were president, what would you begin to, um, to downsize, eliminate, redirect to states? What are the programs at the federal level uh, that we, we need to get out of the federal government? Well, that's a difficult question because that's a long list. I'd rather you give me the list of one of the things we should keep. Yeah. <laughs> that would be a short list. Well, what should, well let's turn, flip it around then. Uh, what, well, what should the federal government well, we be should doing? Keep. Well, we should uh, have a system of sound money and property rights and contracts. We should have uh, a judicial system. We should have a uh, government that, uh, and a defense, a defense of this country. That was not meant to be for the states, but not a heck of a lot else. We weren't supposed to have 100,000 federal bureaucrats who carry guns. People are supposed to carry the guns, not the bureaucrats. So, no, I think everything should be up for grabs and it should be grossly reduced. And both parties have added departments endlessly for the last five, six, seven decades. And that's why, it's, that's why freedom is not the issue anymore. It's tyranny, it's big government, and we're trying to struggle uh, to hang on to this. But I think we're in a desperate state of affairs because it's slipping by and with the economy in shambles like 
like we have today, I, I think we're in much bigger trouble than a lot of people realize. Uh, you mentioned the Federal Reserve. And um, you know, you and I have worked on the the idea of an audit. It's uh, bringing out a few things that we didn't know. Um, they, they apparently um, are printing a lot of money, buying our own debt. Um, what is the solution with the Federal Reserve? Do we need to return to a gold standard? Um, um, you talk a lot about sound money. Exactly, what would you do as president? Well, the president has a limit to what he can do because the uh, Federal Reserve was created by the Congress. It could be restrained by the Congress. It could be eliminated by the Congress. But the most important thing is for the people to understand the business cycle. Who causes the business cycle and how do we get into recessions and depression? And it has to do with the Federal Reserve. So you can't wave a wand and get Federal Reserve. Even I, who have written about and talked about the Federal Reserve, I don't say close the Federal Reserve down in one day. But I would like to at least see competition. Why can't we legalize the Constitution on money? Competing currency, let gold and silver be used for legal tender. Today, if you use gold and silver, you can go to prison. And the counterfeiters are over there at the Federal Reserve. So. Uh, <laughs> What we, we, we need, uh, well, and, and you join me and, 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 and Steve as well, on auditing the Fed is very important. I mean, what we found out, even though we didn't get the audit, we passed it in the House but not in the Senate, but what we got in the audit was that we found out in the bailout, the Fed was involved with $15 trillion passing out to their buddies, one third of it going to foreign banks. I mean, this is such an outrage. It's bigger than the Congress itself. So it has to be reined in. And at certain period of times in our history, Jefferson got rid of a central bank. Jackson got rid of a central bank. And when the issues of money goes before the people, they always vote for sound money because it makes sense to say, why should the politicians be able to spend at will and then just print money when they need it? And then they wonder why we get into trouble. So yes, we have to take the Fed on because it does cause the business cycle. If you want to understand recessions and depression, you have to understand the Federal Reserve System. Ron, as you know, the, the president's going to call us all in um, this Thursday and give us uh, another speech on creating jobs. Uh, what would be your jobs plan? Mm. Well, what you need to do is uh, repeal about 70 years of bad economic policy, which uh, isn't all that easy because uh, we follow Keynesian economics, and Keynesian economics teaches that you need to spend more money. No matter how much debt the people, in de uh, people are in debt and the government's in debt, they advocate just more spending. So you have to reverse that concept. Now, we, we have to do a lot. We have to repatriate our capital. When you have a weak currency, capital leaves our country. So we've been issuing the, cent we've been issuing the reserve currency of the world so our dollars go out and buy goods and services so our jobs go with it. So you have to change that so it's a monetary issue. But you also have to look at the tax code. You have to, you, you know, everybody's talking about cutting a little bit on the capital gains. I want to get rid of the capital gains tax and get rid of the income tax, shrink the size of government. Believe me, you would have the jobs then. But uh, of course it's, it's uh, not going to be easy because Half the people in this country, they sort of like receiving your money, and they're not going to go away easily, but what it's going to lead to is the destruction of our currency and the bankruptcy of the, of the country, and that's going to be much worse than somebody t withstanding a cut. But uh, you have to change that. You have to change the regulatory code, the tax code, the monetary system, and really, I believe you have to change the foreign policy because that's a drain. All great nations fail because they spread themselves too widely around the world, and we've done it as well. Well, let's take the last uh, minute and uh, just give us your perspective of foreign policy, what needs to be changed. Well, I would take the advice of the founders, and I would take the advice of George Bush when he ran in the year 2000. No nation building. You know, uh, don't be the policeman of the world. He was highly critical of Clinton. So I would say that we should have a foreign policy of staying out of entangling alliances. I mean, who, why should we cheer on the entangling alliance of NATO and the United Nations? Here, here look at the mess we're in in Libya today. So I would say we should be out of all those international organizations. We should defend this country, but it would mean bringing our troops home. Yeah! Let, let the troops come home and spend their money here. Now that would be a monetary injection I could support. But no, we're subsidizing the welfare state of Germany by paying for their defense. It, it, 
and uh, Japan as well as South Korea. Thank you, Ron. Um, I'd like to shift just a little bit and pick up on something I've been anticipating that uh, Jim DeMint would ask, and that would be, uh, I know you're on the record, balanced budget amendment. What conditions would you support in a balanced budget amendment? Well, I, I don't want uh, any chance that they would raise taxes to balance the budget. So, uh, and, and I support the general concept of a balanced budget amendment, but I emphasize the spending side of the equation, you, you know, uh, that we have to cut the concept of government, the appetite for big government. But, uh, and again, the balanced budget amendment, we should do it. Uh, Jefferson wanted to have it. They rejected him. But if you don't deal with the Fed spending more money than we spend, you know, it doesn't accomplish anything. They, be, you know, spent, spent trillions of dollars more, so we have to deal with that whole concept. There's going to be a vote on a balanced budget amendment, at least we anticipate. And that balanced budget amendment is not defined in the bill that sets up the super committee. And uh, so there is a balanced budget amendment that's on the calendar of the House uh, to require it caps it at 18 percent of GDP, requires a supermajority to waive the balance, to raise taxes, or to, um, uh, let's see, raise taxes or to waive the balance. Would you, would you support a constitutional amendment that put those conditions in it? Um, assuming you think that's you know a restriction, a good restriction. Yes. Yeah, I would I would lean toward doing that, but I don't think there's enough restrictions on there because I think there's a fallacy in our GDP, because you know if uh, if we rebuild a lot of buildings because we have hurricanes, the GDP goes up. So the GDP is not a good measurement of economic growth. But no, I would uh, certainly, you know, most likely I would support that, but I don't like the GDP approach because it's a deceptive economic term. Let me, um, Robert Rector of the Heritage Foundation released a study a year and a half or so ago that identified 72 different means-tested federal welfare programs, 72. And uh, I'm pretty confident no one could list them from memory nor describe how they work. How would you address this welfare state that America has become? Well, it, it's going to be difficult unless we change the attitude of the people because we're living now with a third or fourth generation that have been taught that entitlements are rights. And liberty uh, and rights aren't, have anything to do with entitlements. Entitlements means that you can take somebody else's money, you know, and the government's there to redistribute it. So you can't do it. You have to do, you, you know, waste, fraud, and abuse. We have to do whatever we can, but that's not it. It's the philosophy of the entitlement system. But every time, so often when we think about the entitlement, generally we think about, oh, somebody's going to get food stamps. Well, let me tell you, the big entitlements goes to big corporations. That's where the co corporation, that's where a lot of the money goes. You have to look at everybody who gets a check. And a lot of corporations get special benefits and checks. So that whole idea of redistribution, redistribution of wealth has to be challenged. But any program that you can, uh, you know, chisel away at, I think you have to do it. But uh, that's, that's the crisis we face because all we, we've witnessed it already. Every time you go and make a little cut, some of our state governors try to make cuts. And there's a lot of dissent. A lot of people get very angry over it. And we have to be prepared for that because uh, the financial crisis is going to get a lot worse. By next summer, the big tax is coming, and that's going to be the inflation tax because we have fallen back on this idea that we can spend and print money and the devaluation of our currency every single day is being devalued sharply. And if you look at uh, its relationship to gold, you realize how big, how big of the trouble it is that we're I, I facing. Just, I just concede to your points on, on currency and the Fed and then go to the welfare state of this again. And I, and I would pose this question that um, there's data out there that shows that 47 percent of the households don't pay federal income tax, 51 percent of wage earners don't pay federal income tax, with 72 welfare programs out there. So if you could fix the Fed, are the rest of these a problem, and how do you really address those so that it's effective? Well, you know, I would say that when people ask me that half the people don't even pay taxes, I say we're halfway there. <laughs> 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 but, but you no, know, I, I know you don't want me to talk about the Fed, but, but it's, it's the Fed that causes the deficits and the entitlement because we don't even have to, we don't have to tax people, we don't have to borrow the money. We know, everybody knows that if Congress runs up these debts, the Fed is the lender of last resort. They're the creator of the, of the money of last resort. So you can't address entitlements unless you look at the monetary system. 
Okay, well, uh, all right, I'll just, I want to go another step in this. The, the global reach component of this, as you were finishing up when Jim was, uh, was talking, that how does, what's the globe look like if you start bringing back American troops? You pull them out of Germany, out of Japan, out of Korea. Is there any place out there that you would have forces outside the territory of the United States? No, I'd bring them all home. I'd, I'd bring them home. There's, there's, would, you, uh, would you then project power into any part of the world with the Navy? No, the uh, power. You want to have, uh, you want to have the facility to defend our country, but we're less able to defend ourselves right now because the number one uh, threat to us now is terrorist uh, attacks. And you know, before 2000, uh, before 2003, when we went into Iraq, on the average there were three suicide attacks uh, per year. By 2007, there were 700 per year. So the attacks have grown by leaps and bounds because of the very presence that we have overseas. The troops are over there because of miscalculation, and the miscalculation is the fact that uh, we've never asked, as a country, what was the motivation of 9-11. If you don't ask the motivation and you continue to do the same thing, those numbers of, of attacks are going to grow and grow, and the more troops you put around the world and looking at the sanctuary rather than at the problem, the greater danger we're going to be in and the more vulnerable we'll be in, and besides, we're bankrupt. We can't afford it anymore. So I would bring the troops home. It would be a big boom to the economy. I believe we would have a stronger national defense, not a weaker national defense. Thank you, George. Uh, Congressman Paul, thanks for being with us uh, today. Uh, as you know, after the Civil War, the Constitution was amended three times, uh, and there were additional powers delegated to the national government. And I want to call attention particularly to the power delegated to the national government in the uh, fifth section of the 14th Amendment, and that's the power to enforce the guarantees of privileges and immunities and due process and equal protection in the first section uh, of the amendment. Now, uh, I know that you have a strong and consistent pro-life uh, voting record in the Congress. Uh, you uh, believe in the uh, inherent and equal dignity of all members of the human family, including the child in the womb. So I'm wondering whether, in view of those delegated powers, you would, as President, propose to Congress appropriate legislation pursuant to the 14th Amendment to protect life in all stages and conditions, or do you believe that you would have to wait for the Supreme Court to reverse itself in Roe versus Wade before you could do that? No, I wouldn't wait for a constitutional amendment. I wouldn't wait for Roe versus Wade to be reversed, but I would, uh, you know, remove the jurisdiction uh, from the federal courts so the states could immediately do what they want. And we wouldn't have wasted the last 10 years trying to, uh, to, to stop the abortion. But when you refer and use the 14th Amendment, it, in, in, it implies that the 14th Amendment repealed the 9th and the 10th Amendment, and it, that don't quite read that into that, the people who use the 14th to do almost anything they want because it's now a federal government. It's a, and it is true, the 14th Amendment has been used to increase the size and scope of the federal government, which I disagree with because I think it should be held at the local level. But in no way should you interpret the 14th Amendment as repealing the 10th Amendment in particular. Well, it's certainly true that any constitutional provision can be abused, and many of them have been abused. But the language of the 14th Amendment is very clear. It, it says that no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process, process of law, or deny to any person the equal protection of the laws. But if, so, if that were, were the case, they would have taken, uh, no states would be involved in dealing with, with murder, uh, injuries, uh, second degree murder, manslaughter, uh, robbery, armed robbery, everything is still states, so you, you just can't pick out one, you should have no state laws against murders. Uh, Under well, those, your circumstances, this should be a, state, a federal issue. Uh, well, only if the murder laws are being denied to the protection, uh, the protection of the murder laws are being denied to a class of people. So, for example, if uh, the state withdrew its protections against killing, uh, if the person killed is of a certain race or ethnic group, then certainly under the 14th Amendment, the national government would be empowered to act. So because if it withdraws its protection, the state withdraws its protection from a class of human beings, let's say the unborn, or if it were the newly born or handicapped newborns, wouldn't that uh, call for, not only permit, but call 
call for action at the national level well, under Section 1 of the 14th Amendment. If, uh, if he wanted to stretch the interpretation and enhance the uh, power of the central government rather than enhancing the power of the local government because they deal with all acts of violence, I mean, I think they're quite capable of doing it. Some of these things are, are more difficult. There are some states have uh, have capital punishment, some places don't, and it's still, it's still, it, it, I can understand your argument, but I think it really rejects the notion that the states were part of this republic that we created. So if you get gradualism of be sending more and more, soon as the interstate commerce clause, soon, soon as the general welfare clause, and I think when we can, and we, and we certainly can, we've done it for all our history to deal with violence and murder, this has always been a state issue, and I uh, don't see why we uh, would have to turn that into a federal issue. Matter of fact, the founders never even thought we should have, uh, you, you know, a federal police force, but we, we do. We have a federal police force, and you're sort of asking for more policemen, you know, at the federal level, and uh, I, I don't understand what, uh, why we've met so much resistance on uh, returning the jurisdiction or removing the jurisdiction from the federal court. If we have done that 10 years ago, you'd say millions and millions of abortions being done because the states could have prohibited it right away. You could have done it with a majority vote with the president signing it. You, you wouldn't have had to wait for the Constitution to be changed. You wouldn't have to uh, uh, wait for uh, Roe versus Wade to be repealed by the courts. Well, uh, Congressman Paul, if I can shift uh, to another uh, issue. Uh, poverty is a reality in the United States of America, unfortunately, with the greatest, wealthiest country in the world. We know that uh, past well-intentioned efforts, especially at the federal level, to fight poverty with big bureaucratized government-run uh, programs have not been e effective. Often they've done more uh, harm than good. But does that mean that there is no role uh, for the national government in fighting uh, poverty, or do you see some role that the national government would play? If not, should this be a state issue, or is this an issue simply for private charity? What's your well, view? Obviously, it should be a state issue. It shouldn't be a federal issue, uh, because it has, you even admit it didn't, doesn't work uh, very well. So, no, no, it should be a state issue, but it has a responsibility. If you understand the economic environment that is necessary that the federal government can create, sound money, don't, don't over-regulate, don't over-tax, don't run up deficits. That's the environment that the federal government creates, destroys the job. That whole system of taxation and monetary policy sends our jobs overseas. So yes, they have a responsibility. But to say, well, all right, yes, there's only a few people who need our help, so we're going to give, we're going to give food stamps for the very needy. Well, what happens is you give food stamps for the very wealthy, and you endorse that principle 100 percent. We're up. running Thank out of time, but oh, is time up? Time I'm up. very sorry, uh -huh. David. Yes. Thank, Thank you, you Congressman. very much, mm -hmm. Congressman Ron Paul. Thank you. And next, former Massachusetts Governor Mitt Romney.